Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers? Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. Good to have you here. We're going to get caught up on day two of testimony in the Rust movie shooting trial. So we'll be ready for when court resumes tomorrow. Before we get started, you know what to do. If you're on YouTube, don't forget to hit subscribe, like the video, share it with your friends, and you can ring my bell if you want notifications of when I post new content. Music fact of the day. What does the song Karma Chameleon mean? Boy George explained to Billboard magazine, the song is about the terrible fear of alienation that people have, the fear of standing up for one thing. It's about trying to suck up to everybody. And basically, if you aren't true and you don't act like you feel, then you get karma justice. That's nature's way of paying you back. I was looking online this weekend and came across a really beautiful post by Jensen Ackles, who is an actor on this movie after the shooting of Miss Hutchins. He said, this has been a tragedy of epic proportions that we are all still processing. Earlier last week, I felt compelled to tell Helena just how awesome I thought she was. I told her how incredible I thought her camera shots were and just how exciting it was to watch her and her team work. Truly. She laughed and said thank you and gave me a hug. I'll forever be thankful we had that moment. She had a spunk and passion that infected the entire crew from the top down. She was an inspiration. My heart and prayers go out to Helena's husband, son, and the rest of her family. There just aren't enough words to express what an immense loss this is. She will be incredibly missed by all of us who knew and admired her. He goes on to say that he and his wife have donated to the AFI scholarship fund that's in her name and also the GoFundMe and tells his followers if they're able and feel compelled. Here are the links for more information. We left off with Marissa Popple on direct. She is the crime scene technician with the Santa Fe Sheriff's Office. They talked the day before about ammunition being found in a Mary Kay bag. You see loose spent blank rounds and boxes of different kinds of ammunition. Under the boxes were additional loose rounds and the side pocket, more loose casings. There were 17 rounds in a foam case inside that Mary Kay bag as well. They show one photo of 3840 dummies, but there were also other types of ammunition inside that box. She found one spent casing on the prop cart and they show the live round found in one of the two boxes that the officer took off the prop cart and put in his car. She also helped with the search warrant at the PDQ warehouse. That is the prop company that was supplying ammunition to the set. They did find live ammunition and they only collected live ammunition from that search warrant. What they found there was visibly different from the live ammunition that was found on set. There were stamps on the ammunition as well as the shape of the projectile being different. The primers were brass and the ones on set had silver primers. They bring in photos of the deconstructive live rounds that were sent to the FBI that was found in the ammo box from the set. They also sent a live round from the PDQ warehouse that was deconstructed by the FBI as well. The side-by-side -side comparison is very clear if you look on YouTube here, the gunpowder between the two projectiles are different. Ultimately, the witness has around a thousand blank rounds in evidence, 15 functioning guns, and three belts. On cross by Mr. Bowles, who I think is a great defense attorney, he's very good at picking apart testimony, also being respectful. I watch juries a lot, and you see a lot of times when defense attorneys get very verbal with witnesses, it makes the jury uncomfortable. So he has a very good technique of being very effective on cross, but also being gentle enough to where he doesn't look like a jerk. The defense has her talk about her training and she has not had any specific training in identifying types of dummy rounds, blank rounds, and comparing that with live ammo. She did send the rounds to the FBI for confirmation for some rounds, whether they were live or not. For example, one round didn't shake, so that was sent to the FBI for analysis. And ultimately, it was a dummy round, but the ball bearing had gotten stuck inside and didn't make the audible noise that they look for to confirm it's a dummy round. The defense asked if she can look at a picture and tell what are dummy rounds. And she says she can with the hole in the projectile or the missing primer. He points out that she testified about measuring projectiles, but hasn't had any specific training in that area. She also hasn't been trained on identifying the shininess of projectiles, and points out that color changes on dummy rounds can come from oxygenation. The defense brings up that 
she testified she didn't get DNA off the projectiles. In fact, she said it's kind of the industry standard not to. She called the FBI from their area to talk about this. And the defense said they requested that the projectiles be tested for DNA and also to see if there were any fingerprints on them. And they asked if she talked to the detective about that. She said her understanding was that it was done, the fingerprint testing. He asked where the FBI report on that is, and she said, I would assume the FBI has it. She's not familiar with it, nor has she seen it. She took photos of different areas of the crime scene, including the church, the prop truck, and Seth Kinney's PDQ warehouse. Now, just for reference, the shooting was on October 21st of 21. The search warrant for the prop truck took place on October 27th, and the search warrant for PDQ was November 30th, which over a month after the shooting. And the defense asked if she has any idea whether or not Mr. Kinney disposed of anything in the time between the shooting and the search warrant. She's like, I don't know. Mr. Kinney received rounds from the set of Yellowstone 1883, and one of the signs in his shop said live 1883. The defense says that was empty at the time of the search warrant. The witness said the box with 1883 is the only place, by the way, that they found live rounds. The defense points out there were tons of ammo boxes in the warehouse and asked if they looked inside each one. She says she thinks so, and then she says she can't be certain. She's asked if she took Kenny's word for it, and she said no. They dug through the boxes, and it was very time-consuming. She didn't ask if he got rid of or used any of the rounds before the search warrant, and she said, I didn't interview him. He points out that one of the boxes in the Mary Kay bag was Seth Kenny's box, and she agrees. If you remember from the previous episode, one of the points that was made was that the shipment from Mr. Kenny came a couple of days after the FBI identified live rounds, a couple of days before that shipment came. He asked if she's aware if Sarah Zachary may have taken anything from the prop cart and put that in the prop truck. She doesn't know. She doesn't know if Seth Kinney's box was moved from the cart to the truck either. She's asked how long it took her to get to the scene, and she said they had a meeting first before they headed to the ranch then it took about 30 minutes for her to drive there. The defense asked if Alec Baldwin was segregated in a vehicle. She doesn't know. She said she didn't see him talking on the phone in person, but later on she did see photos of that in the media. She does remember Hannah being segregated. And the defense points out the chain of custody would be broken if someone removed things from the prop cart. She said, of course, it would cause problems because then they don't have that evidence. He asked the witness if she was aware that Sarah threw rounds away. She did not know that. The defense points out that Sarah taking things from the prop cart to the prop truck would disturb the scene, and the photos that the witness took of that prop cart would not reflect how it looked at the time of the shooting. The witness took the boxes back to the prop cart to take photos. She placed them back on the cart. It's kind of a big no-no. And the defense says, you have no idea if that's where they were before they were moved. She said that wasn't her reasoning behind placing them back in the scene but she agrees she doesn't know where they were originally. Y'all, they bring in some photos from this PDQ warehouse, and I'm just going to say, I'm not trying to be mean, but this looks like it could be on an episode of Hoarders as opposed to being a prop warehouse. There is stuff everywhere. None of it's organized. I mean, there's just things slung all over. I mean, there were boxes piled up in the alleyway behind the entrance to this place, there's just stuff all over. I mean, you might get lost in there and not found for a while. They zoom in on a lot of these boxes of ammunition on the shelves. There's all different kinds of ammo. Ammo was also found in other areas of the warehouse. And the defense points out the ammo boxes can be bought online. They ask if she knows what the JS means on the ammo box, and she does not. There's gum belts draped over chairs. I mean, this place is just in disarray. They also show a box that says Live Ammo 1883. Inside that box, there's various boxes of ammo. They show some photos from the church, and one is a back shot of Alec Baldwin. The defense says, you testified you had no contact with him on set. She said this was the only interaction she had with him, which was taking photos of his clothing and then retrieving the clothing from him. The defense says, so you knew he wasn't segregated in a car. She said her interaction with him was less than 10 minutes, and she doesn't know what he was doing before or after that. They show a picture. You see the truck in the distance, and the defense points out 
that the truck, the prop truck, is not within the crime scene tape parameter. The search warrant for the prop truck was October 27th. And on the inside, there are some gun belts, some ammo boxes. They show a close-up of some 45 Colt rounds on a gun belt. They do have silver primers, and none of those were live. Remember, in openings, the defense said some of the dummies did have silver primers, and they weren't live. So on redirect, the prosecutor says that PDQ provides props to movie sets, and the only live ammo the witness found was in that one box marked 1883. By the way, she was only looking for 45 caliber live rounds during the search warrant because that's what the search warrant allowed. Now, the defense asked if she had any idea if Sarah moved evidence from the prop cart to the prop truck. Then the prosecution asked, are you aware if Hannah moved anything from the prop cart to the prop truck before it was searched? Of course, she don't know. The state talks about her being asked about her training and identifying the difference between live rounds, dummy rounds, and blank rounds. And they ask if crime scenes on movie sets are common, and she says no. She does, however, have training in guns and ammunition, and she's capable of measuring things. She's capable of distinguishing different colors, different shapes, and she doesn't need specific training to do any of that. Only two dummy rounds out of 250 did not rattle or have that hole in the side. The primers on the live ammunition she collected at PDQ were silver and brass. None of those looked identical to the live rounds that were found on set. So she was done with her testimony, but I do believe that they kept her just in case they need to recall her in the future. The next witness was Christopher Zook. He's retired from the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office. On the day of the shooting, he was a sergeant in the Criminal Investigation Unit. He participated in the search of the prop truck, and they located a firearm in the safe, which was taken by the previous witness, Ms. Popple. The guns would be cleared by him for safety and then taken into evidence. He did come across a Ruger lever-action rifle. It's a very old-style gun. He didn't know where the magazine was located on that firearm. So he stood up and demonstrated how he worked that rifle to eject the projectiles. And you engage the lever, which puts that projectile into the tube. And then when the round is spent, it kicks it out. When you come back around, it reloads another round. He was able to do this a couple of times, but there was a round that jammed. And that was it for direct. On cross, the defense asked if he's familiar with the lever rifles, and he admits he is not. The defense points out, you don't have to lever the rifle to extract the rounds. He said he didn't know that then, but he does now. They had their gun expert at the sheriff's office come in to show him that there's a part at the end of the barrel that you twist and the rounds come out. The defense asked if the rounds were dummies and he doesn't know. He gave it to their evidence tech who was checking to see whether or not these were live or dummy rounds. On redirect, he was present when the officer was unloading that rifle. One round was just jammed in the barrel of the gun. They had to manipulate that to get it out. So the state was done at that point, but the defense asked if they could ask a couple of more questions, and the state said yes. The defense asked if he knew that when he levered that rifle, that jammed the round in the barrel. He said yes. He said he did jam it, but he assumed all the rounds inside were the correct rounds for that rifle. The next witness is Ryan Lidsinger. He's a videographer with a production company in Albuquerque. They outfit productions with crew, lighting, sound, directors of photography, and they also rent equipment and crew to different productions. Their company was contracted to do electronic press kits, and he explains that there are days reserved for behind-the-scenes footage, cast interviews, and his company films those. He also worked in Video Village. That's where you can watch footage of what's being filmed remotely and away from the set. On October 13th, and the 15th of 2021, they shot that behind-the-scenes footage, the cast interviews, and also capture production audio. They don't usually film the movie, but more the actors and the crew working on the set. He sent the prosecution 126 videos, and she sent 17 back for him to review. Those 17 videos were filmed on October 13th of 2021, they admit those videos to use throughout the trial, and that was the end of questioning for the state. On cross, the defense asked if he watched any scenes with Alec Baldwin being filmed, and he did. The defense asked if Baldwin seemed to be in command of those scenes. He said the only one that stuck out and he didn't seem to be in command was one with him on a horse pretending to be dead. The defense clarifies as far as how scenes were being filmed. Did Baldwin seem to be in control of that and how quickly he was asking people to work? 
there was a big objection and a sidebar. When the defense gets back, he's asked if he made any edits to the videos that he sent to the state, and he said no. On a redirect, the prosecutor asked about Video Village, and she asked if the monitor that the director of photography is looking at, are they only looking at what the camera is recording? He struggles with this answer, and the prosecution ultimately just says they'll ask someone else about it later. The next witness is Jason Hawks. He owns a company that analyzes cell phone extractions for attorneys. The state asked him to analyze data in this case by reviewing the raw Cellbrite data extraction of Hannah's cell phone. He didn't do the extraction himself. That was done by the forensic department in Santa Fe, but it was sent to him on a hard drive. When an extraction is done, not everything on that phone is downloaded. They do get calls, text messages, pictures, videos, and things like that downloaded from the device. The redacted data is run through the program and then it breaks it up into categories like cell phone pings or location data. Photos, audio files, notes, text messages, iMessages, voice logs, and things of that nature. He verifies the phone number and email addresses from the device. By the way, on Friday, there was a bit of a thing about this because it was live streamed, her phone number and the people she had been contacting. And very quickly, everybody whose number was put on that screen started getting harassing calls. Alex Capriello, by the way, from News Nation, asked the prosecutor, whose name is Carrie Morsey, about the number being broadcast. She said it's the defense's job to redact that out to protect their client's privacy. Hannah's phone was an iPhone 12 Pro Max. She did have iCloud backup enabled. The data was extracted on December 8th, 2021. The owner name of the phone, brace yourself, y'all. I'm just going to put it out there. Gorilla Grip Pussy Pal. Note to self, don't ever name your phone something you don't want right in court. One contact in her phone, I believe is her dad. It was Dacula, like Dracula, but Dacula. They pulled text from October 20th, the day before the shooting. One text thread between a 928 number, which is Hannah, and 505, which is somebody unknown, Hannah says, LOL, I don't need that tonight anyways. Right on. I might go smoke in the jacuzzi soon, but maybe not. I'm so pooped. She texts again at 7.48 p.m., headed down to get high out back. An incoming text at 8.24 from this person says, time to eat now. How did the blaze sesh go? Hannah replied at 8.25 about a minute later, I'm still smoking. On November 8th of 2021, between 4.08 and 5.24 p.m., there is a text thread. She texts her dad, Hey, I need you to check out my boxes and send me pictures of our boxes of dummies. Dacula sent back a message saying, Will do, and then attached a photo of that ammo box. On December 1st of 2021, there is a text between Hannah, Jason Bowles, who is her defense attorney, and her dad. So a text from dad to Hannah. Get someone to show her a single action gun and how it works. They don't go off by themselves. The response from her attorney to Hannah's phone, yes, I sent her this manual I got today also. I think I sent this, and then there's a link attached to that text. The response from Hannah's phone, yeah, honestly, that gun won't go off unless he fully cocked it. The defense attorney Bowles replies, if someone could just show her, she could see a transfer makes no difference. In another text, December 1st of 2021, from Hannah's phone, yeah, we got some that just aren't long barreled. They are the same thing, and dad says exactly. He did extractions from other people in the case, Sarah and Dave Halls. Dave Halls, the first assistant director. He was charged in this case, by the way. He pleaded guilty to the charge of negligent use of a deadly weapon, and he received probation for that. Back to the witness. He's on cross. The defense asked if he did extraction for Dave Hall's phone. He has the Cellbrite report that was done by New Mexico authorities. Some items were deleted and recovered on the phone. There were two deleted messages. One was from WhatsApp and one from iMessage. There were five deleted emails and some deleted images. He's not sure if the deletion was from Mr. Halls or if those images got purged. He goes on to explain that if it's purged, it can't be recovered, but they were able to recover some of the deleted emails. There were 20 emails in the extraction and the witness says they're incoming emails to a Gmail address. The phone had... 152,237 images total with 1,438 of those deleted. There were 3,214 videos and seven of those were deleted. I mean, that sounds like my phone, so it's not super suspicious. 
As far as things stored on iCloud, for example, if a photo is stored on the cloud, you actually just have a thumbnail on your phone, which is a gateway to the actual image. If something is on the cloud and there is no gateway, you can get that recovered with a search warrant. For Sarah Zachary, they did not do a search warrant to get anything from the cloud from her device. October 12th of 2023, he's asked if he had a conversation with the prosecutor. He doesn't remember specifically, so they bring in this email communication between them. He was requested to get texts, videos, and photos from September 15th of 21 through November 21st of 21. There were some photos that were not on her phone, but were on the cloud. On a redirect, they ask if it's possible for someone's phone to delete things without the operator doing it. He said, when we go to a website or to a social media site, the phone will capture certain images that go into a cache folder, and eventually they'll be deleted, but not by the user. It's not from the person's camera roll or their email. The next witness is Catherine Rowe Walters. She was on set that day. She's a unit production manager. They make sure day-to-day -day operations go smoothly. For example, if a crew member needs something, they'll come to her. Hannah never asked her for additional training time with Mr. Baldwin. Hannah never asked for additional training days as an armorer to her. When they weren't filming, the side door and the rear roll-up door of the prop truck was secured by padlocks. The department heads or teamsters would handle that. Props was Sarah Zachary and armory, both Sarah and Hannah shared keys. The other department heads were a few other people whose names she can't recall but would have had keys. The witness, by the way, did not have keys to those locks. A couple of days after the shooting, Hannah contacted her to meet at the prop truck. Hannah was heading home and wanted to get some of her personal items off the truck. The Teamster captain would have access just in case it needed to be moved or needed maintenance. She doesn't know everything Hannah took out of the prop truck, and she said she saw a few things she took, a couple of gun belts and cardboard boxes. By the way, this was prior to the search warrant on that prop truck. On Cross, they say you allowed others to get their personal property from the set. Law enforcement cleared the scene and you allowed people to get their things, not just Hannah. The entire camera crew, which consisted of six people, by the way, sent her that resignation email the night before the shooting happened. The next day, the witness had to get other cameramen. The crew that quit came to the set the next morning to get their stuff off the camera truck. He asked if Hannah had asked for additional training for Mr. Baldwin, and the witness just doesn't know. He asked if she asked another staff member, and she said no. The truck was not secured when filming was going on. It just stayed open. They'd start at 6 or 7 a.m. in the morning and would go to 7 or 8 p.m., Everyone on set theoretically had access to that prop truck. She doesn't remember the name of the teamster who had access to the prop truck after the shooting. She said she never heard any complaints about Hannah during filming, and after the incident, she went to the church two days after to remove media from the cameras to see if anything had been filmed. She removed all that, and there was no footage of the incident. She doesn't know if anyone had access to the camera after the shooting and before she came to get that film. She was there when the search warrant was executed on the prop truck. Seth Kinney was there, by the way, the owner of the prop warehouse. A lot of the firearms there were his, and she doesn't know if he was let into the prop truck. She stayed outside and looked in while the search warrant was going on. She doesn't know if the prop cart was in the prop truck. He asked if it was, who would have put it in there, and she doesn't know. She did not have the combination to the gun safe either. She saw Baldwin doing gun training from a distance, but she wasn't involved in that. She's asked if she observed that Baldwin was not really paying attention, and she said his back was to her, he was up a hill, and she doesn't know. On set after filming for the day, the defense points out that Hannah and Sarah had to clear out. They weren't afforded time to clean the prop truck, and the witness says that's correct. During the day, they were busy. Again, didn't have time to clean. On a redirect, the state says between October 21st and 27th, did anyone other than Hannah request to get anything off the prop truck? And the witness says, not to me. On set, they only had security guards at the gate to the ranch, but not walking around. The location's remote, not easy to get to. The prosecutor said one of the reasons the camera crew indicated they were leaving is because of accidental discharges from firearms on set. There's an objection, and the prosecution says she's just impeaching this witness. They go to sidebar. When they come back, she asked if she knew one of the reasons they were leaving is due to safety concerns and accidental discharges on set, and the witness 
says yes. The camera crew stayed at the camera truck, which is different from the prop truck. The cameramen and women will often bring their own equipment, and they did on this set. That's why they came to retrieve their stuff the day of the shooting. She's asked if during the day when there was filming, was the prop truck overseen by a Teamster? She said yes, but she didn't know if he stayed there all the time, but he was around. The witness has been the production manager on three or four productions prior to this, but none of those had an armorer. The defense again asked if they can ask a few more questions. So they ask about Baldwin not paying attention during gun training. They point out in her pretrial interview, she said he wasn't paying attention. She said that's what she was told, but she didn't see it herself. Regarding the accidental discharges, there was a discharge with special effects, and she confirms that. They ended court early. This was really weird. I'm, we don't know what happened, but the judge sent the jury into the jury room to answer a question. And once they answered that question, they were free to leave. Wasn't said what was asked. We don't know. We may never know. But I have to say, both the state and the defense in this case are top notch. They're direct, and Cross is kind of like a masterclass, really, in how it should be done. It's a very interesting trial, but now we are all caught up. So tomorrow, I'll have a recap of day three of testimony. I think it's going to be very interesting to see who they call and what we talk about. But in the meantime, I hope you guys have a good rest of your Sunday, and we'll see you soon.